Toba's greetings. I'm your host, Dr. Wolfulan. When I'm not drinking and doctoring, a great combination, I'm here at the Wolfulan reviewing movies. Welcome to review three of five in October 2020, where I cover the first five Halloween movies that normally star Michael Myers, but in this case, star an alcoholic, divorced, womanizing doctor played by Tom Atkins. Ladies and gentlemen, we are trading up with this video as I revisit Halloween 3, Season of the Witch, released in 1982. Now, this movie was actually the subject to the first ever October video a decade ago, How Time Flies, but hopefully I have some new stuff to say, and if I don't, well, I guess there really hasn't been any improvement in the last decade. Anyway, after Halloween 2 came out, it was a big hit. Not as big as the first movie, of course, but it made more money domestically than Friday the 13th Part 2 during a big horror movie boom, so a third film was guaranteed. The only issue was, well, what was the third film gonna be? Carpenter and Hill felt that they definitively killed off the shape and were tired of the slasher concept, so after tabbing longtime collaborator and father of the Michael Myers mask, Tommy Lee Wallace as the director, it was decided that Halloween 3 would be an altogether different movie. Halloween 3 is as indirect of a Halloween sequel possible while still being a Halloween movie. It was intended to be a transition point for the franchise becoming a horror anthology series. Now, some people have gotten the wrong idea, touting the false claim that the Halloween series was always intended to be an anthology series from the very beginning. That's not the case. It was simply decided at the start of Halloween 3 to become an annual anthology series with different stories because the creators were sick of Michael Myers. Stop it! The script itself was penned by Nigel Neal, a respected British sci-fi screenwriter brought on board, and he definitely brought along his sensibility to the project. Without jumping ahead, Halloween 3 definitely feels like a British horror movie that just happens to take place in America. Halloween 3 isn't a knife movie. It's a pot movie in the vein of Invasion of the Body Snatchers. For the leading man, Tom Atkins, who worked with Carpenter on the Fog and Escape from New York, was chosen for the role. Now, I'm gonna be up front. I've always liked Halloween 3 because from my first viewing, I knew exactly what I was getting myself into, but theater goers in 1982 don't have the luxuries we have today, and Universal's ad campaign wasn't exactly clear about what they were going to get, so Halloween 3 was unfortunately lambasted upon release. The film's reputation has, of course, since changed, but enough Gavin. Allow me to show you why this once misunderstood sequel has become a Halloween cult classic. Before I delve into the plot, I got a comment on the flick's opening sequence, a serious departure from the previous films. Orange horizontal lines composed of pixels gradually flicker to life over a particularly atmospheric sci-fi sounding Carpenter Howarth track. Eventually the lines are revealed to make out a jack-o'-lantern icon on a computer screen. The intro gets across the film's overarching theme. Before the movie was released, Universal issued a very campy trade ad that featured a computer wearing, uh, a witch hat, with the tagline, Witchcraft enters the computer age. A different terror begins. Essentially, Halloween 3 is about the ancient traditions of the Halloween season colliding with the technologies of the modern day, hence the jack-o'-lantern on a computer screen motif. The plot itself opens with a guy who I think was one of the dudes killed in the Godfather montage, evading more of Don Corleone's thugs. I don't care who you are, though. If you get crushed between two cars, you're gonna want to take a nap. At a nearby gas station, a rejected Lamont Sanford watches an exposition double feature, the only bit of setup that Stonehenge was kidnapped. It weighs more than five tons, making its disappearance a mystery indeed. Followed by the first Silver Shamrock commercial, which is probably the most iconic thing in the whole movie. Visually, the Silver Shamrock commercials are basic, but what makes them stand out besides establishing the company and its trio of glow-in-the-dark masks is the damn catchy earworm jingle that plays throughout the movie to the tune of London. London Bridge is falling down. The song starts out seeming goofy, but as the film goes along, the tune gradually carries on a sinister tone as a countdown to the apocalypse. If only our current apocalypse had such catchy theme music. Anywho, the gas station attendant is jump scared by the late night jogger. They're coming. I'll have what they're having. Meanwhile, we're introduced to Dr. Dan Chalice, played by Tom Atkins, the star of this film, who is the exact opposite of the teen girl protagonist these movies usually have. Dr. Chalice is a real man's man who practically has beer coursing through his veins, always making sure he has a brewski at the ready in case of emergencies. Drinking and doctoring, great combination. Dr. Chalice is a ladies' man, too, a real womanizer. <laughs> 
virtually every female character in Halloween 3 shows some attraction to or had a past relationship with this suave motherfucker. Even this bitch Tom Atkins barely shares a scene with was Tom Atkins' actual wife at the time. Dr. Chalice is also a family man. <laughs> only shown on screen with his kids one time late at night briefly, but he makes sure to make the occasion special, gifting them plastic masks he found at a drugstore for 50 cents that they very quickly scorn in favor of their deluxe silver shamrock masks. Ungrateful brats, well at least their dad's masks aren't going to turn their fucking heads into bugs and snakes, though that does sound kinda cool. Nice try. Oh yeah, Chalice's nagging ex-wife is played by Nancy Keys, one of the few returning cast members from the original Halloween. Jamie Lee Curtis also returns, but only on TVs playing clips from the original Halloween and in voice as an announcer or phone operator. I'm sorry, we cannot complete your call as dialed. Well, it's still more dialogue than she had in Halloween 2. Dick Warlock, who played Michael in Halloween 2, returns as well as a different mute guy in a suit. Halloween 3 prominently establishes that in its universe, the events of the first two Halloween movies are fictional, but people still got confused. About the Silver Shamrock mask, there were only three, which is a bit lacking and selection for Halloween masks, but the variety is there, featuring the Halloween season staples of a jack-o'-lantern, a skull, and Sarah Jessica Parker. The masks were, in reality, made by Don Post's Mask Company, which evidently had no problems manufacturing masks for a movie with the message that masks might turn your heads into bugs and snakes if you aren't careful. The masks are beautifully rendered and distinct in design. The witch and skull were modeled after existing Don Post masks, but the jack-o'-lantern was custom-made for the film. You can almost buy that every child in the world would want one of these masks, regardless if it matched their costume or not. Almost. The overarching plot of Season of the Witch is one of conspiracy and intrigue. The man clutching a silver shamrock mask is taken to Dr. Chalice's hospital, where I'm sure he'll receive the best boozed up medical care possible. But the man is given a surprise nose job in his hospital bed. <laughs> and the mysterious rhinoplasty surgeon does his best Richard Pryor impersonation. Witnessing such a savage act would shake any other man, but luckily Dr. Chalice has alcohol and cartoons of marijuana plants to filter out any negative emotions. Still, when Ellie here, the daughter of that dead guy with the fucked up nose, played by Stacy Nelkin, comes searching for answers, well, Dr. Chalice decides to come along for the ride. Probably to get laid based on him bringing a six pack and telling his ex-wife he's not hanging out with the kids. I mean, let's face it, nothing makes a lady hornier than finding out her father was murdered a few days ago. But what he said was, they're gonna kill us all and in a little while he was dead. Now, Ellie's dad owned an old-fashioned novelty shop that sold Halloween masks, not one of them newfangled hardware stores selling Halloween masks, and the super sleuths figure that whatever got Ellie's dad killed started in Santa Mira, home to the Silver Shamrock headquarters, the source of only three kinds of masks and a really catchy jingle. Santa Mira? Where they make those? Oh. Little place, not too far away. Now, Santa Mira is a company town with a real eerie Stepford Wives feel going for it. Something is off, and it doesn't help that literally every citizen in town is watching you. The Silver Shamrock Company's name isn't just for show. Santa Mira is a Northern California town with a predominantly Irish heritage on the West Coast. I don't fucking know how that happens, but hey, at least they don't have to pretend they're not shooting in California with this movie. The actual California town that portrayed Santa Mira is named Lolita which is a sketchy as fuck name, but it's a great looking location with a wide open small town vibe that feels like a front, like it's hiding all kinds of dark secrets just around its corners. Now, Halloween 3 is a pod movie, not a slasher film, but the producer of the movie, Dino De Laurentiis, demanded that there still be certain slasher conventions, namely a gory body count and some fucking. Now, about the gore, well, the original writer of this film, Nigel Neal, took offense to his script being rewritten to add more graphic violence and had his name removed from the credits, which is understandable, but even though Halloween 3 has gore that isn't really necessary for its kind of horror movie, the violence isn't too excessive and doesn't really feel all that out of place. The movie has such a goofy premise that some cartoon violence feels right at home even. Still, the middle act admittedly has Dr. Chalice and Ellie staying at a motel, where a bunch of other characters are also arriving simultaneously to stay there that serve no function beyond padding out the body count.
This place is a zoo. There's the Kupfer family, Buddy, Betty, and Buddy Jr., a quirky clan whose patriarch is the highest selling vendor of Silver Shamrock's murder masks. Buddy Kupfer and family, here to see Mr. Cochran. Also, there's Marge Gutman, who again is played by Tom Atkins' actual wife at the time, a woman who is miffed about a mask supply chain problem. They may make great masks, but ever since they started doing big volume business, the little guy has to stand in line, you know what I mean? Of course, we can't have Tom Atkins, a man pushing 50 in this movie, paired with his actual age-appropriate wife. It's just not something anybody is willing to accept. No, no, we need to see this guy fucking a 23-year-old chick he just met with his real wife reading a book next door and see Dr. Chalice sucking on this girl half his age's titties because no woman can resist Tom Atkins and you better believe we see his ass. Fuck yeah. Oh, also amidst all the character introductions and sweaty lovemaking going on, Dr. Chalice meets Santa Mira's local drunken vagrant who claims that something odd is going on in Silver Shamrock factory. Seen the TV cameras yet? He's watching you, friend, I guarantee you that. Oh, he's just a wino talking shit. Though, a couple of guys in suits do corner this dude and, uh, effortlessly rip off his head like they were cracking open a can of blood soda, but I'm sure this is a totally unrelated thing. Halloween 3's motel sequence is a bit tiring. It's just there to efficiently throw in exposition, introduce a bunch of new characters, and toss in some slasher conventions. The key plot point of the motel sequence, though, is establishing the true threat of the film in memorable fashion. Mar Marge decides to fiddle with a loose silver shamrock mask tag, and it fires a laser beam straight down her throat. Now, this might seem weird, but this also happens when you take the tag off of a beanie baby. Marge herself is taken off to the Silver Shamrock Factory, a mask factory that apparently has a top-of-the-line medical facility. They're taking her to the factory. Should we have the most marvelous facility there for emergency treatment? This is the equivalent of a parent telling their kid that their dog didn't die. They just went to a farm where they can get fresh air. This scene introduces Connell Cochran, played by the late Dan O'Hurley, the head of the Silver Shamrock Factory, a mask maker and novelty inventor, the Willy Wonka of Halloween. My apologies for that little bit of a disturbance last night, but I want you both to know that Mrs. Gutman is going to be fine. Seeing as one of his mask tags shot a laser beam into a person's fucking face, it goes without saying that Cochran is the film's main antagonist, and O'Hurley is fantastic in the role. Hey, Mr. Cochran, just what is the final process? I uh, sure it's just a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Connell Cochran is a pure evil character with the most sinister, over-the-top ambitions, but he presents himself as this cheery, charismatic, Walt Disney-like figure incapable of malice. Even when the jig is up, he still pretends that he's totally on the level for quite a while. I do love a good joke, and this is the Best ever. A joke on the children. O'Hurley, he enjoyed working on the film, and you can tell he had a fun time playing the character, but he later stated that, well, this movie sucked. But hey, I don't think this movie was going to be many people's thing. Before I move on to the film's memorable final act, I do gotta give random kudos. The Carpenter and Howarth score for this film is fantastic. It feels like a marriage between the classic Halloween score and the more futuristic Escape from New York score, perfectly getting across the film's science fiction themes and old school Halloween mythology. Of course, the Silver Shamrock theme is probably up there as the second or third most memorable piece of music in the Halloween franchise, though for totally different reasons. What's the matter? Don't you have any Halloween spirit? No. Dean Cundy, for whatever fucking reason, decided to return a third time as the cinematographer for a Halloween film, and with a lesser cinematographer, this film could have looked like low-rent schlock and the film would have totally fallen apart, but Cundy brings a level of class to the visuals that elevates Halloween 3. Bringing Santa Mira to life is a town perpetually bathed in the orange light of sundown during the day and at night as a place of stark shadows. When you see the montage shots of trick-or-treaters, it's fucking incredible. Incredible looking how they're mostly in silhouette, but you can still make out exactly what their costumes are. Winding things down, Ellie and Dr. Chalice are pretty clear on there being evil stuff going on in the mass factory, seeing as they have clones of the guy that killed Ellie's dad. So they decide to leave town, but not before splitting up. Yes, information. I I'm sorry, we cannot complete your call as dialed. Oh, holy shit, I didn't think they'd kidnap Ellie while Dan was away. Chalice decides to infiltrate the factory to rescue Ellie because that pussy is too good to leave behind, and once inside, the doc decides to pump an old lady from the 19th century for answers. Where is she? Where is she? Oh, 
great. Even grandmas are being replaced by automation. Chalice gets into a brawl, and the film confirms definitively that Tom Atkins can punch a robot to death. It also confirms that robots are filled with tang. Mmm, delicious. Yeah, Cochrane has an army of robots that do his bidding. Sophisticated androids that perfectly resemble humans, but it calls into question. If he could do this in the 80s, why is his main business making masks? He could sell robots that could turn on their masters, or he could simply have androids infiltrate society, or, or just have robots shooting lasers that turn people's heads into bugs and snakes or something else. The outer features took much longer to perfect, but then of course in the end it's just another form of mask making. I feel like the androids are just thrown in as an idea too many when they could have just been human slaves brainwashed into following Cochrane's orders like robots. Seems like just an extra conspiracy plot point that leads to that coroner finding robot parts in the movie's earlier blown up car, which results in her getting her haircut messed up with a drill. I mean, the android twist is followed up immediately by Cochrane showing that he stole fucking Stonehenge in the most underexplained way possible. We had a time getting it here. <laughs> You wouldn't believe how we did it. Why don't you fucking tell us how you did it anyway? Well, the movie isn't super clear on why Stonehenge was stolen, but it's implied that chipped off pieces of Stonehenge are used in the production of Silver Shamrock's masks. At least the tags are, which contain a microchip that is activated by a specific TV signal. I think you can guess what TV signal. What you really need to see is a demonstration, and there's one coming right up. Cochran's demonstrations of the mask's true purpose is one of the highlights of this film and the Halloween franchise as a whole. The Kupfer family are escorted to a fucking bomb shelter decorated as a living room and don't think anything's up even when they get locked in. Man, if only all my kidnappings and murders went this smoothly. Of course, Buddy Jr. puts on his mask and watches a preview of the big giveaway, making sure to lean in a safe distance away from the TV. But not safe enough. Yes, apparently what Silver Shamrock is giving away is a head full of bugs and snakes. Well, it's still better than candy corn. It's a bizarre revelation, but it's executed in such a vivid and entertaining way as Buddy's parents are helplessly killed by the insectarium coming from their son's noggin. Now, the masks don't really turn heads into bugs and snakes. It's a little more complicated. You see, the film's novelization reveals that the masks actually open small portals to another dimension that the deadly creatures come from on a massive scale. It's very abstract and weird, but just imagine that on a world scale and the stakes are totally apocalyptic. The Festival of Sowen. The last great one took place 3,000 years ago when the hills ran red. Cochran's motivations are pure evil. He just wants to play a Halloween prank on the kids of the world through the dark arts of witchcraft, bringing Halloween back to its sinister ancient roots on a massive level through modern technology, sacrificing millions of children in the process. Jehovah's Witness kids will be fine, though. Sacrifices are part of our world. Cochran leaves Dr. Chalice to die, but no restraints can hold Tom Atkins, who pulls off a Halloween-themed prequel to Die Hard, rescues Ellie, and gives Cochran a taste of his own medicine, tossing a box filled with snake bug lasers at his men and computers, which apparently really pisses off Stonehenge, and it turns Cochran into a skinnier version of Marlon Brando in his final years, who becomes one with the Force. Wild stuff. Dr. Chalice and Dr. Frankenfurter escape, but it turns out Ellie is actually an android. Wait a second, Cochran could make lady androids too? He could have been cleaning house with all the sales he was making. Look at that firm grip. Chalice, of course, vanquishes the Robo Ellie, like, four separate times. I don't know why she was so hard to kill when the other one died after being punched once in the tummy. <laughs> Anyway, though, the film ends symmetrically with Chalice rushing to the gas station seen at the start that, for some reason, gets trick-or-treaters. Chalice uses the station's phone to plea for the major TV networks to pull their Silver Shamrock giveaway ads. All but one is pulled, despite Tom Atkins' highly persuasive uttering of Stop it. Stop it! Stop it! Honestly, it's pretty impressive that he was able to convince one guy over the phone who apparently had the power to pull a multi-million dollar ad campaign off of two TV networks. That's a pretty big win on such short notice by itself. I count this as a happy ending. Stop it! <laughs> 
Halloween 3 on its own is a fun, crazy movie that doesn't make any sense but is oozing with Halloween charm through its weirdness. The film's one true failing was being a numbered sequel with a marketing campaign that failed to communicate the film's premise and switched to an anthology format, so of course this movie was gonna get backlash. Honestly though, I love Halloween 3, but it was an odd decision to make the switch to an anthology format with an insane, hard to explain movie like Season of the Witch. I mean, the first Halloween is a simple idea, man in a mask stabs people. The Halloween anthology format may have been successful if they just started with something a little simpler or just made it a separate movie series. Oh well, I give Halloween 3 Season of the Witch a head full of bugs and snakes out of Tom Atkins' ass. Watch the magic pumpkin, kids! If you like this video, like it, and if you loved it, journey further into the wolfy lair by clicking the subscribe and bell buttons to find out when all of my latest videos and streams go live. This video was brought to you by my kind supporters on Patreon, whose name are scrolling by. Support the channel today on Patreon and get access to bonus movie and TV commentaries, audiobooks, comic readings, film live streams, and credits at the end of videos. Finally, I'd like to give a very special thanks to my true Wolfie Light supporters on Patreon and my YouTube channel memberships for their pledges. Their support is greatly appreciated and helps the channel and my dark influence continue to grow. Thank you all once more from the bottom of my evil heart for your help. Alrighty, Dr. Wolfie signing out. See you all next time at the Wolf Yulair.